All right. Hello, everyone. This is me again. As you know, in response to the coronavirus outbreak, we are going online. There will be no further regular classes. So I'm going to prepare uh, lectures, online lectures, and then post it most probably on YouTube so that you can go there and watch the lectures as many times as you wish. <clears throat> I'll try to be brief in order to reduce the size of the files. And each chapter will be provided in multiple parts. All right, so we are going to start a new chapter, chapter six, which we will actually start a new concept, the second law of thermodynamics. So, so far we have talked about the first law of thermodynamics, which is simply the conservation of energy. So energy cannot be reproduced, sorry, energy cannot be uh, destroyed or produced. It can be converted from one kind to another. The second law of thermodynamics is different. The second law talks about the direction of processes or the direction of transfer of energy, which we call transfer of heat or work. So, if you look at a cup of coffee, a cup of hot coffee on the left side of the, the slide, you put a cup of hot coffee on the table, heat will transfer always in the direction of from the coffee to the surrounding, to the ambient. It cannot happen the opposite. So, heat always transfers from high temperature to low temperature. That's a consequence of the second law of thermodynamics. If you look at a resistance, a resistor, as you see here, as electricity or electric current passes through the resistor, it will be converted to heat. Some of it. Some of it will be dissipated to heat. <clears throat> now, do you want to do it the opposite? Meaning that if you heat the resistor, will you actually generate electricity? Not in the normal circumstances. The answer is no. Therefore, the energy, ha the energy has a direction. The, sorry, therefore, the, the way that the processes can occur, they, they do have a direction. So, for instance, in this case, we can convert electricity directly to heat but we cannot simply or directly convert heat to electricity. It is definitely possible, but it's not just, you know, a natural process. Okay, so this is an introduction. <clears throat> now let's move to the next slide. So basically the second law gives, tells us that the processes occur in a certain direction and not in the reserve direction. And for a process to occur, both first law and second law of thermodynamics must be satisfied. Otherwise, the process will not proceed. So major uses of the second law are as follows. So the second law may be used to identify the direction of processes that we talked about so far. Also, it helps us to determine the quality of the energy. We have kind of indirectly mentioned that, for instance, we can say that quality of electricity is better than quality of heat because electricity can be directly converted to heat, but heat cannot be directly converted to electricity. So electricity is better. Mechanical forms of energy such as kinetic energy, potential energy, these are higher quality type of energy. And also, another use of the second law that we will consider and study in this chapter is that the second law of thermodynamics helps us determine the theoretical limits. The theoretical limits of some of the thermodynamic processes and devices. So, what is the maximum efficiency that an internal combustion engine can have? So, what's the best efficiency of an automobile? So, when you want to purchase a car. So the second law of thermodynamics helps us gain insight 
about the maximum or the best performance of a particular process and device. <clears throat> so, in this chapter, we will frequently deal with or talk about reservoirs. So, thermal energy reservoirs such as atmosphere, lake, river, oceans. These are large bodies of fluid, usually air or water, and basically by exchanging heat between these reservoirs and other systems, there will be no change in the temperature of the reservoir. For instance, if you if you exhaust some hot gases to the atmosphere, does it actually change the temperature of the atmosphere globally? No, because these are very large uh, systems, reservoirs are systems themselves, but they are so large, they are so massive, which makes them insensitive to a change in the temperature. So we are going to frequently use this reservoir. So if a reservoir provides heat, then this is called a source. So we usually use it in place of a furnace. So when furnace means like, or when we do have a combustion process, a process that provides heat, such as in it could be combustion in the internal combustion engine, it could be the furnace of a boiler, or any other device that provides heat. We usually replace it and model it by a thermal energy source. This is like a modeling process. On the other hand, a reservoir which actually accepts the rejected heat is called a sink. So this happens, for instance, in, a, in the condenser of a thermal power plant. It also happens in the exhaust of an internal combustion engine when we exhaust the still warm flue gases to the atmosphere. So that can be replaced by a thermal energy sink. So sink source these are actually like abstract concepts which come in place of actual devices that either provide heat for the case of source or they actually accept heat in the case of sink. So in summary, a source supplies energy in the form of heat and a sink absorbs it. And we do we do need this in order to have a, uh, a thermodynamic or mechanical system, such as a power plant, internal combustion engine, and so on. Okay, so now let's talk about the concept of heat engine. So a heat engine, basically this is what we have here. Okay, before that, let's talk about some background. So first of all, if you look at the first uh, image of this slide on the top left corner, so we can see that work, a shaft work, if you do have a shaft rotating in water, so the shaft work can be converted to friction, due to friction can be converted to heat. So all of the shaft work can be converted to heat. However, the opposite is not true. So if you, for instance, you heat the water, the shaft will not start to rotate in a reverse direction or in the same direction. So we can convert work, shaft work to heat, but we cannot simply convert heat to shaft work. This is very similar to electricity to heat, but not heat to electricity. So then what to do? So because oftentimes we do have heat, we can provide heat from a fuel and we want work to be extracted out of this heat. Like in an automobile. So we can, we do have, we can provide heat from the fuel, but how to generate mechanical motion? The answer is to use a heat engine. So heat engine is a broad concept. <coughs> And it, it includes multiple, 
different types of actual uh, devices or engines. So a power, a thermal power plant is a, is a heat engine. A nuclear power plant is a heat engine. A jet engine is a heat engine. And an internal combustion engine is also a, a heat engine. So in summary, in a heat engine, we provide heat, some heat, we receive some energy, some like motion or electricity and so on. So if you look at on the left side of this slide, we see uh, schematically how a heat engine looks like. <clears throat> so basically the heart of the heat engine is a circle. And then this circle, which actually com is comprised of a cy cyclic process, is connected to a source, high temperature reservoir, a source, and to a low temperature reservoir or a sink. So some heat is provided in the form of Q sub in or just Q in. So this Q in part, part of it is converted to work, which we, which is W net out. In the case of an automobile internal combustion engine, this is the, the, the torque and the energy in the form of like uh, shaft work, which is provided, you know, to the car. So the rest of it, the difference between Q in and W net out is rejected to a sink. So this is a heat engine. So in summary, if we look at the, the rectangle there, the heat, the devices that convert heat to work are called heat engines. So they receive heat from a high temperature source. They convert part of it to work. They reject the remaining waste heat to a low temperature sink. They operate on a cycle. So, and <clears throat> by the way, the fluid that transfers, you know, the energy in this processes could be any fluid. It's usually water in the form of steam or liquid water and also air to model the combustion gases. <clears throat> a very good example of a heat engine is a thermal power plant, steam power plant that we see in on this slide. So, first of all, if you look at the top of the the diagram, you see a energy source such as a furnace. So the furnace provides heat. So in the furnace, a fuel like coal or natural gas is kind of is burned to provide heat. So it provides Q in or QH to the boiler or to the entire uh, heat engine. And then at the bottom of it, we do have like a sink, energy sink, and that's where condenser rejects energy to this sink, Q out. So, a thermal power plant, as we have actually seen it before in the class, is comprised of multiple uh, devices. All of them steady flow devices. So first of all, let's start from the pump. Okay, so in the pump, uh, liquid water is pumped to a higher pressure. So pump does need W in. So pump needs work in in order to impart energy to the to the water to pump it to a higher pressure and then the water at high pressure enters a boiler it absorbs Q in it's evaporated converted to steam and then the steam enters the inlet of the turbine it's high pressure high temperature steam it performs work W out and then at the exit of the turbine the steam doesn't have much energy left so in, in fact, it is, it has, it is, it's kind of saturated now. It loses the energy from superheated. It becomes nearly saturated vapor or saturated liquid vapor mixture. Then in order to be able to repeat the cycle, this uh, saturated vapor enters a condenser. In the condenser, using an additional uh, another stream of water, usually a cold water. 
So this steam exchanges heat with that water stream, which could, for instance, come from a river or from a cooling tower. <clears throat> and then it gives away its heat to, this, to that stream of water, which is actually the sink or the river. So then it's converted to just subcooled water, and then it enters the pump, and the process continues. <clears throat> So this is, a, this is an example of a heat engine. So the heart of the heat engine now is actually has been broken down it, into its components, boiler, turbine, condenser, pump for the case of a power plant. So what we can write for this heat engine is two things. So first of all, if you look at the heat, this power plant, you see that the W net out is equal to the turbine work w out from by coming out of the turbine minus w in the work needed by the pump so this is the net amount of the work the difference between the turbine work and the pump work another equation that we can write for the entire heat engine is the first law of thermodynamics Energy in minus energy out is equal to delta U if we consider the whole thing as a closed system. But because the whole thing works in a cycle, delta U is equal to zero. So energy in minus energy out is equal to zero. So now for this power plant, energy in is Q in and then energy out part of it is q out and the rest of it is w net out so that's why we can write q in is equal to q out plus w net out or w net out is equal to q in minus q out so this is true for uh, for a heat engine so we can also go ahead and define the thermal efficiency of a heat engine. So the thermal efficiency, as the name suggests, is equal to efficiency is equal to the useful thing that we achieve divided by what we have to provide. So for a heat engine, we need to provide QH. That's the heat that we provide. So it, it comes to the denominator. And what is the useful thing that we achieve? That's the work W net out. So the thermal energy, the thermal efficiency is therefore equal to W net out divided by QH. So if we replace W net out by QH minus QL, so this QH, before we had it in the form of Q in, so QH, Q sub H, or Q sub in, both of them denote the same thing. QL or Q out, both of them denote the heat which is rejected uh, by the heat engine. So now if you replace W net out in the definition of the thermal efficiency by QH minus QL, we will end up with this important equation, eta thermal, the thermal efficiency of the heat engine is equal to 1 minus QL over QH. <clears throat> so we're going to use this thermal efficiency a lot in this chapter. So we can, so about some properties of the heat engines. So some heat engines perform obviously better than others. So it means that the efficiency of the heat engines cannot be necessarily the same. For instance, if you look at the left side, we do have two heat engines, both of them uh, interacting with the same source and with the same sink. So this could be, you can think of it as two different automobiles, both of them use gasoline, and but they generate different, for instance, uh, efficiency. Well, they, they do use the same size of engine, the same amount of fuel they use. Both of them reject the exhaust gases to the atmosphere, 
but let's say one of them is model 1990 the other one is 2020 so the, the new one is has a higher efficiency <laughs> so we can say that even two heat engines working under the same conditions they may have different efficiencies so if you look at this example heat engine one its output is 20 kilojoules of work its input is 100 kilojoules of heat therefore the efficiency of heat engine one is 20 percent the efficiency of heat engine two is 30 divided by 100 is 30 percent so and then if you look at the one on the right side that one actually generates 55 megajoules divided by 100 megajoules of energy coming in so the efficiency of this heat engine is 55 percent so the efficiency are, of heat engines are not equal so now you can imagine that okay so how the second law of thermodynamics can help us to figure out what is actually the maximum efficiency that we can get out of a given heat engine with identical source and sink so whether it's 20 30 55 what how high it can go what's the limit so second law will help us to do this. <clears throat> so we are getting close to the end of this part so now the question is that in order to increase the efficiency of a heat engine can we actually save this q out or q l because if i go back I, which seems that i cannot on this mode so can we actually uh, not reject some of the heat to the atmosphere in the case of the internal combustion engine in an automobile can we have no exhaust can we save can we convert all of the energy of the fuel to work the answer is that no <clears throat> because these devices work in a cycle so for instance if you look at what we see on this slide let's say we add some heat to this gas at 30 degrees c and in order to lift the load okay so we lift the load let's say 15 kilo kilojoules of work is extracted now what so we want to keep doing this process but if so now that the load has been lifted we have it has performed some work but in order to bring it down again to repeat this process then we actually need to remove some heat from the gas in order to bring it to its initial state so that it can work on a cycle so the answer is that we cannot save q out always some energy has to be rejected to the atmosphere in order to bring the fluid to its initial state so that we can continue the process so with this we are actually ready to for formulate well conceptually describe the second law of thermodynamics based on the kelvin planck statement so it simply says that it is impossible for any device that operates on a cycle to receive heat from a single reservoir and produce a net amount of work so it means that we cannot save q out so what you see on the diagram on the right you see that this heat engine is interacting with the source it receives 100 kilowatts of heat and converts 100 converts all of it to work so 100 kilowatts of heat is coming in it generates 100 kilowatts of work this is impossible so this means that the efficiency of this heat engine is 100 percent it means that it can convert 100 percent of heat to work it's impossible we can convert 100 percent of work to heat that's actually what happens but we cannot convert 100 percent of heat to work that's the limitation of the 
second the limitation imposed by the second law of thermodynamics so in a heat engine only a portion of the heat is converted to work the rest of it is rejected to the atmosphere so this is the end of this lecture thank you for your attention and this is usually equivalent to uh, more than one more than 50 minutes of lecture time in the class so since i spoke non-stop here so it is actually more efficient in terms of in terms of uh, delivering a large amount of materials however for you to understand it you may need to watch it multiple times and feel free to uh, write down questions send me questions post them on the on the course forum and of course don't forget to uh, consult the supplementary links and also of course don't forget to study the textbook multiple times so part two and three will come after this thank you for watching